as the community of Bluff grew, Amasa Barton decided to build a trading post out along the San Juan River. They had a good business trading with the Navajos, offering goods and services that the Navajos had not had earlier. There were many days that the Navajos stayed around the trading post and visited, talked, did whatever they needed to do. On one occasion, two Navajos came in, Old Eye and a Renegade, asking to trade a broken pistol for one that Amasa had pawned to them a time earlier. Amasa did not think that was a good idea and told him he couldn't do it. The younger Navajo became upset and he pulled a gun to shoot Amasa. Amasa ducked and the bullet struck the older Navajo, Old Eye, and killed him. Upon seeing what had happened, the young Indian shot again and hit Amasi in the back of the head. Feeney, Amasi's wife, heard the shots and came out, saw what had happened, and she sent one of the Indians to town to get help. The young Navajo gathered up his dead friend and went back across the river to report what had happened at the trading post. Of course, his story indicated that Amasu had shot Old Eye, and that caused a contention. People came to help, and they carefully carried Amasu back to Bluff, where he laid for eight days before he passed away. Several days after the Amasu Barton incident, a hundred, uh, approximately a hundred Navajo men rode into town on their horses. Their faces were painted black. Somebody went and got to Bishop Gents, and he and his son-in-law, Cumin Jones, and John Allen Jr. came, and Gents asked the Navajos to get down off their horses and to talk as friends. Some of the older Navajos did get down. Uh, the younger ones didn't want to, but Gents kept talking to them and finally all the Navajos got off their horses, laid their weapons down. Uh, gents had a steer killed and brought food from the co-op store and fed them. They talked, and at the end of the day, the Navajos went home and it seemed to establish peace. I think the Navajos recognized that he was a man of courage, an honorable man, a man who kept his word and they could sense that he wasn't afraid because of his calmness. I think it calmed them, and they were able to diffuse the situation and, and had peaceful relations restored.
One of the unique aspects of the fort is how each cabin's back was part of the outside wall. There were no windows in the back. The doors all faced inside the fort. There was a common ground where they would meet and the children would play and everything they, they needed was there so they wouldn't have to go out in the area where they thought they may have been injured by someone or something. It didn't take long for them to move out of their log cabins into some beautiful homes that they built, big stone homes that still are there today. They really built an amazing community. Today, when you visit the fort, the first thing you will see is the beautiful two-story co-op building that is a replica of the original co-op that was built in the late 1890s. Also at the fort, people can actually walk inside of the cabins and see the antique decor that the individual families have decorated themselves. And each one of the family's histories is told inside of their cabin. A visit to the Bluff Fort is a wonderful way to feel the spirit of those incredible pioneers. The Bluff Co-op had quite an, an interesting history. Eventually, it got to the point where the cooperative aspect was dropped, and they actually sold it uh, to a man named John Hunt. He was in charge of that, and if I remember correctly, he bought it in 1920. By 1925, the, uh, the co-op had ended. There was a drifter who came into town, used a pseudonym, Fred Starr, and everybody knows him by that. He was a questionable character, but John Hunt decided to take him on as, a, as an employee in the store. John was off on business one week, and Fred Starr went in there with the express purpose of robbing him. And he was going for all the goods he could get and was going to uh, take them and flee. And he made a major mistake. He got in there and uh, he wanted to cover his tracks by having the building erupt in fire. He brought in flammable materials and got it spread out, lit it, and then uh, part of the, the container exploded. And the roof was just blown off. It was such an explosion. and had landed in the street, and the fires were engulfing the building. And here was Fred Starr. He was trapped in the building. Some of the rock that had fallen off from the explosion had pinned him and uh, this woman remembered him crying out for help. There was an individual who uh, took a blanket and put it over him and went in and tried to, to free uh, Fred Starr, but uh, wasn't able to. And so Fred was consumed in, in the building. There was a lot of effort made to try to contain the fire, which they did do. But as far as the building itself was concerned, the whole thing was consumed. There was nothing that, that could be done. If you look at pictures of it, of the remains, you see the, the few standing walls and everything else was down. So that was the end of the, the uh, co-op, and the, the co-op itself had ended as a combined institution sometime earlier when it went into the private hands of John Hunt.
It's not known where they really came from. Their wagons were drawn by horses. Some white men made improvement by blasting them into rocks. Most of their drilling was by hand. They worked hard. There are still signs of where they're, they drilled in the rocks. They made trails so they could bring down their wagons. They made their home down in the valley. Along the cliff bottoms, they live in tents. Eventually, they built cabins. They help each other. They drill it well and had lots of pipes helping them move water. They even made water available to their cabins. There was a white man who wanted to make a dam for water for everyone. Past where the highway is now, they had huge garden area and cornfields. The corn was gathered in the central area among the fields. If you help, they were generous to give you from their surplus. They could understand Navajo. We communicate with them. They appreciate the help of the native people who live nearby. They were very generous. They had cattle. They had milk from the cows. They made cheese and butter from the milk. They made bread. There was no grocery store. Everything was homemade. They had lots of chicken and pigs that they used to supplement their food. Then, eventually, they built schools and a post office. Near the post office, there was a huge building where they had church. They also gathered and sang and played instruments there. One of the men in Bluff was named Red Whiskers. His home was made of rock, but later became rubble. He spoke Navajo very well. Keith Jones and other Jones family said that Red Whiskers was their grandfather. I don't know how he lost it. The Red Whiskers had an amputated foot. The white settlers in Bluff were very kind. When you went to visit them, they fed you well and even gave you bread and jelly to take home. In return, we would take a whole sheep up for meat to them. Sometimes they give us two dollars for a sheep. They like mutton and lamb. We would get word that some families need meat and we would deliver it to them. That's what I remembered. We all help each other. Now, it's not that way.
The women had a lot of responsibility. Not only did they have to cook, build the fires, make the food, mend, wash, they had to look after the children. And the children were many. Everybody had responsibilities. Even the children were given chores. They would send them out to get firewood, but if they couldn't find firewood, they would find the dry cow patties and bring them back to build the fires. We know that the men herd the cattle, but the mothers had to herd the children. I think they had a much tougher job because their job never ended. Sarah Williams was asked by her sister to come along on the trip to help take care of her children. Now Sarah was a 19-year-old girl from Wales. Sarah always had a positive attitude and she was very much impressed with the unity and the good cheer of the people that were on the trip. In fact, one of the things that Sarah said is that she could not imagine anyone not have an enjoyable time on the trip. Sarah wrote in her journal, Imagine my surprise when six miles outside of Cedar I was handed the reins and was told that this was my team to drive to the San Juan, something I had never done before. There were two babies born on the Holland Rock expedition. A little girl was born in 50 Mile Spring. Her name was Lena Deseret Decker. Another baby, the one we know a little bit more about, was born on Gray Mesa, a little boy born to the Larson family. It happened to come during a terrible blizzard, and while the father was outside the wagon trying to set up a tent to make a good place for this little baby to be born, the mother was very busy inside the wagon delivering the baby. And so little John Rio Larson was born on Gray Macy in the middle of a blizzard, which just goes to show that babies are gonna come whether dad is ready for them or not. When you're using these tools, swinging as hard as you can into the rocks, eventually the points of these tools are going to get dull, and they get dull fairly fast. This is where the blacksmiths come in. They had two blacksmiths at the top of the hill. They kept them busy. It was a science for these guys to get the steel just the right temperature and quench it and make the right hardness. If you got it too hard, then it would be brittle. If you got it too soft, then it would not stay sharp very long. And when they needed a special tool, like when Ben Perkins needed a wider drill bit for the wide holes used on Uncle Ben's dugway, where they tacked a road on the side of the cliff, the blacksmith was able to make these special tools to do this particular job. These blacksmiths were indispensable. Without their special talents and skills, the hole in the rock road would have never been finished. I am Albert R. Lyman. I was carried in my mother's arms down through the hole in the rock to the Colorado River in 1880. On January 26, 1880, a lone wagon was poised at the top of the perilous descent into the hole in the rock. A man and his wife and three children were there with a team and a horse tied behind. More than 40 companies had already gone down through the hole, and other companies were due to join them from 50 Mile Spring. These were the pioneers to the San Juan country. They were responding to one of the most perilous calls ever made by the leaders of the LDS Church to colonize in a new region. This was a select company of seasoned and well-trained men and women, hand-picked from among the settlers of southwestern Utah. Cedar City, Oak City, Paragona, Parowan, St. George, Panguitch, New Harmony, and Harrisburg. Their objective was a home site near the juncture of Montezuma Creek 
and the San Juan River in southeastern Utah. The primary purpose of their mission was to win the favor of two hostile tribes of Indians to provide a buffer outpost against the encroachments of refugee outlaws and invading cattlemen. The route of the company took them through Escalante, a small out-of-the-way settlement in Potato Valley. The route was thought to be a shortcut, six weeks to traverse. At Escalante, the Pioneer Company repaired equipment and obtained fresh supplies. By the 12th of November, 1879, the vanguard wagons had left Potato Valley and had plunged into the desert. Over 60 miles of raw terrain lay between them and the Colorado River. Their course was nearly parallel to the southeastern trend of the Kaparowitz Plateau. to drink and forage for animals were scarce. The first major base camp was established at 40 Mile Spring. It may have been here that for the first time members of the Pioneer Band became aware that perhaps the sacrifice of their difficult trek was an exercise in cruel futility. Rumors had begun to spread that the country in front of them was so incised with gulches and precipitous canyons that a wagon road through was impossible. Gloom hovered over the entire camp. A scouting party was sent out to explore the east side of the river. Their search led them to conclude that no possible route for wagons could be found. It was the opinion of two amazed prospectors encountered along the way that... If every rag or other property owned by the people of the territory were sold for cash, it wouldn't be enough for making a burra trail through that country. A second scouting party was dispatched to the other side of the Colorado on December 1st. One party member summed up his findings. We gave up all ideas of a road being built there. As a result, company leaders reached a tentative decision. The expedition would have to be abandoned. It was unthinkable to continue that impossible journey. history will verify we did not give up. We held a testimony meeting, sang a hymn, and took a vote. The camp was strengthened and united. We decided to go on. We agreed that President Silas Smith should go back to the settlement to see if he could get an appropriation from the legislature for powder and supplies. Brother Platt Lyman took over the job of moving the company forward. Half of the group camped above the hole. The rest stayed at 50 Mile Spring. The most difficult job along the entire route to San Juan was getting down through the hole to the river. The hole was really a narrow slit or crack. At least it was until the Cedar City boys, the blasters and blowers from Wales, went to work on it.
They drilled holes and tamped in blasting powder sent by President Silas Smith. Now the blasting not only widened the gap, but falling rock served as a fill for the steep jagged roadbed in the bottom of the gap. They sure made the dirt and rock fly. About a third of the way down the canyon, there was another drop, too sheer for a roadway. Blasting powder was in short supply, so Ben Perkins and his boys got around the problem in a rather remarkable way. Cut, right. They chiseled out a ledge along the cliff, wide enough for the inside wheels and hubs of a wagon. They drilled holes five feet below the line, parallel to the chiseled ledge. The two-foot stake was driven into each of the holes. Then poles were put behind the stakes and tied down. With the addition of brush and rock and gravel, the outside of the road base was built up until it was level with the chiseled edge. They just plain hung the road up there. It's hard to imagine that Uncle Ben's dugway would be a success. It took six weeks to complete the road down the plunging, gaping, rugged, 2,000-foot drop to the river's edge. At the bottom of the canyon, Charles Hall, his sons, and others, including some Escalante folks, built a ferry to transport wagons across the river. While the road building project was going on, camp life on the rim did not stand still. There was plenty to do to keep body, soul, and spirit together. Food rations were low. Some of us put grain brought along for our animals into coffee mills and ground flour for bread or gruel. Many lived on beef and bread. At the top of Hole in the Rock, there was a smooth, gently sloped surface where we held religious services on Thursdays and Sundays. We often sang, listened to readings, watched dramatizations, and participated in dancing. <laughs> the Virginia Reel, the Welch Jigs, the Polkas, and the Minuets. Sam Fox could sure play a merry fiddle. How I enjoyed those dances, especially the ones at 40 Mile Spring and Dance Hall Rock. On the morning of January 26, the road from the top of the hole to the river was completed. The time had come to send the wagons crashing down either to safety at the bottom or a disastrous fate among the rocks below. Believe me, it took a lot of faith and courage to make the first big jump. The slit, a hole, was still so narrow that we had to be sure to remove the barrels before sending the wagons down. The wagons were so crowded that there was no place to ride except for the driver. Our turns came, I'm sure we all share the sentiments of Sister Elizabeth Decker. Coming down the hole in the rock to the river was bad. It sure scared you to death to look down. The cliffs on each side are 500 feet high, and there is just room enough for a wagon. The first wagon I saw go down, they went like they would smash everything. I will never forget that day. By the end of the day, 40 wagons had safely made the descent. 26 of them had been ferried across the river. Even brother Stanford Smith, the last of the first group at the top, made it down, himself at the reins, and only his wife and old Nick dragging back. 
Before all 83 wagons could get down, the weather had turned colder. By February 1st, there was ice along the shore and we had to do some ice breaking to cross. Once over the river and up the dugway on the east side, we were confronted by the roughest country that any of us had ever seen. By January 30th, the advance group of wagons had climbed up Cottonwood Creek and made camp in a grove of trees. For the first time since leaving Escalante, we found enough feed for our animals and a sufficient supply of water. The women folks made the best of more favorable circumstances. <laughs> it was a welcome change. We were at the place in our journey where what had been called impossible was right there in front of us. Cottonwood Hill. Up a short dugway out of the canyon and onto a steep mountain of shifting sand, hard enough for a man to climb to say nothing of horses dragging loaded wagons, which sank nearly up to the wheel hubs, up, up again to the base of a gigantic rock barrier that seemed to echo defiance and look down with menacing disdain on the puny efforts of our road builders. But we did build a road, a dugway up the solid, sullen rock to the top. On the 1st of February, another thousand pounds of powder sent by President Smith arrived. With more blasting, pick work, and rock reinforcement, the dugway up Cottonwood Hill was completed. It took 10 days. During the time road builders were engaged on the hill, camp blacksmiths fired up their forges. They made shoes for horses and oxen and helped repair damaged equipment. It was important that we be well prepared for the attempted conquest. By early morning of February 10th, the first wagons were on Cottonwood Hill. Some wagons got into difficulty. It's a Holyoke outfit for one. We had to take it to pieces, carry it up the road and onto the top. As I think back on that climb up Cottonwood Hill, especially the Dugways, it does seem impossible, like a miracle but it was the only conceivable place for a wagon road to go. By February 13th, we had established a camp two or three miles below the top of the plateau. A couple of men from Panguitch arrived there to help with the road. They brought with them some pork and 40 pounds of cheese from the tithing office. Since the cheese wouldn't go far among 250 people, it was auctioned off. As a result, we called the place Cheese Camp. The only instance of friction among members of the company that I can remember took place at Cheese Camp. It had to do with the problem between some of the boys driving their horses ahead of the main group and the rest of us who were concerned about forage for our cattle and horses. We finally settled our difficulties. I guess it's a credit to the members of the group and our leaders that more incidents like this did not occur in that impossible country. We were at Cheese Camp long enough for the road builders to get ahead of us again. On February 17th, we were on our way once more. Before long, we found ourselves moving up a natural cut in solid rock. It was steep, I'll tell you, and slick and smooth like an apple. But our teams and wagons went up through it. hadn't found that chute in the rock, we 
might have been delayed for weeks. Tuesday the 17th found us up on the flats. The going was easy. We could see the Henry Mountains to the north. And on the right of us was the San Juan River Gorge. It was deep and inaccessible. On the top of this gray mesa in a raging blizzard, Sister Olivia Larson gave birth to a baby boy. That was February 1st, 1880. They named him John Rio since he was born near the San Juan River. We traveled seven and a half miles approximately on the plateau. Then all of a sudden we found ourselves facing a steep drop of a thousand feet. We would have had a terrible time finding a place to build a road down except that George Hobbs and three companions sent out to scout a route, followed a big horned sheep over the brink and down to the bottom. The road crew went to work again, zigzagging from one ledge to another, following the route taken by that sheep. The road off the plateau was only a half mile long, but the job took a week. With the exception of one broken wagon that had to be abandoned, 82 outfits creaked, groaned, skidded, bumped, and swayed down that torturous Slick Rocks trail. The next day, we arrived at the lake. Windblown sand had formed a natural dam across a canyon to create this wonder. What a beautiful place to camp. Cottonwoods, willows, canes, flags, bulrushes, and several kinds of grass grew luxuriantly. Jutting into the lake were the remains of an old stone fortification built by the Indians several hundred years ago. We camped at the lake for several days. The ladies took advantage of the stop to catch up on things and to enjoy a much needed rest. We took time to repair our gear, shoe some of the horses, and write a few letters. By early March, we were on our way again. Having crossed the dam and a long stretch of sand, we dropped into Castle Wash. There was plenty of grass and water. The country looked a lot better. By the 5th of March, most of the company had assembled at the head of the wash on top of Clay Hill. At this point, we faced still another abrupt descent of 1,000 feet and the necessity of building a road all the way to the bottom. After about a week of construction, the hill road was good enough, we hoped, for wagons to go down, pitching and sliding in places on an unstable surface of wet, slick clay. for the night on the bench below the hill. A howling blizzard hit us with a vengeance. That night was the coldest night many of us had experienced. It was impossible to be comfortable in bed or anywhere else. Up until that time, we stayed pretty much together. But from Clay Hills, the country spread out for quite a distance, and so did the wagons. The stronger teams and the better wagons moved out front. It wasn't easy, even for the hardiest, because of the snow and mud. Several of the outfits, tired and worn out, lagged as much as 30 miles behind. Brother Hobbs summed up the situation very well, I think. Many different parties were on their way to catch up with the main body at the Elk Mountain camp. The weaker ones were in the rear. Some had an ox and a mule hitched together, or cows and heifers. Everyone wanted to know how far it was to San Juan. By Friday, March 18th, most of the wagons had moved to the base of Elk Mountain. There was snow and a good deal of mud. Many of the teams were very weak and needed rest. 
force of men went out ahead and chopped a way through the dense stands of cedars. We were pressed to get to San Juan in time to plant our seeds. An old Ute Indian came into camp about that time. He was astonished to find wagons in the middle of that wild country. When we told him about the route we had taken, he threw his hands in the air in disbelief. It wasn't possible to build a wagon road through that country. We were inclined to agree, and yet somehow we had managed it. But we weren't at the end of the journey, not yet. There were 20 miles of rough road and then Combe Wash, another impossible barrier. A scalloped ridge of solid sandstone 1,000 feet high, extending from Elk Mountain southward to the Arizona Territory. Our weary band labored slowly down the sandy wash, paralleling the ridge for 10 miles. The only passageway across that formidable bulwark of ancient rock had been cut by the San Juan River. We found out to our dismay that the river through the ridge hugged too close to the high perpendicular cliffs. It was impossible to build a road around the north bank of the river as we had hoped. Our only course was to somehow get the wagons up to the crest of the ridge. I think no one can imagine the raw incredibility that confronted us at San Juan Hill. That's what we called it, San Juan Hill, the steepest improbable place to claw out a road in all the wild country we had traversed since leaving Hole in the Rock. It took several days to complete our doubtful dugway angling up to the summit of Combe Ridge. We took advantage of the time to give the women folk and children an opportunity to relax a little. It was our best campsite since leaving the lake. The north bank of the river furnished a good supply of firewood and water. Then on the 1st of April, the last part of our impossible journey began. Our teams were worn out from hard work and insufficient feed. Our wagons and gear were falling apart but we did it once more. Here, seven span of horses were used so that when some of the animals were on their knees fighting to get a foothold, the still erect horses could plunge upward against the sharp grade. On the worst slopes, the men were forced to beat their jaded animals into giving all they had. While many of the horses were so exhausted that, that they took to spasms and near convulsions. Now, the worst stretches could easily be identified by the dried mud and the, the matted hair from the forelegs of the struggling teams. From the top of San Juan Hill, our wagons moved slowly one by one along the rim of Comb Ridge to Butler Wash and finally down to the river bottom. We were 18 miles from Montezuma, our original destination, but we had neither the heart nor the strength to go any further. I repeat that our call to bluff, our call to this San Juan country, is to my mind a call to the most perilous laborer that any people are ever called to by the LDS Church. I love this country. I love it because of the hardships our people had to go through in their impossible journey in coming here, in their almost impossible problem of surviving after they came here. I think I love this country as much as old Sir Walter Scott loved Scotland when he said, 
This is my own, my native land.